I want to talk about teaching useful economics. When I put my when I moved to the University of Michigan two years ago, I put my hand up to teach principles of economics, um, and it's trying to think about what it is we should be teaching our students. I think is a tremendously difficult task. The answer I came up with sounds trite, but I think actually has some substance, is that we should be in the business of teaching useful economics. What do I mean by that? Well, we, we all start with Marshall. Um, he thinks of economics as a study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. If that's true, then an economics class should be useful in the ordinary business of life. And so what I want to do is actually put some substance around that idea. Um, so the first thing is, I think, Useful economics focuses on the roles that our students are actually going to play in the economy. I think that sounds obvious, but when you think a little harder about it, I think many of us fail at that. So, you know, who, who's our student? Is it, is it this guy? Um, sort of looks like a nerdy little guy who wants to learn a lot of economics, right? And <laughs> in fact, it is. And I think much of what we do when we teach economics is we're thinking about ourselves as teaching this guy. If we're a little more modern, we think it's about teaching this woman instead. And when we think about this, and when I say this, you know, here the actor that we're thinking about is the policymaker, and in, in much of what we do, we think about the relevant actor as being the policymaker. And if that's the relevant actor, then our focus is trying to think about what the optimal policy is. And we, we think about that when we teach, obviously, much of macro, what's the optimal monetary policy, what's the, obvious, the, the optimal fiscal policy, international trade, what should a country's trade barriers be. When we teach the market models, we think about what are the optimal market structures. The truth is, not many of us get to teach Janet Yellen. Most of us, our class looks a lot more like this. But these, I think, are still incredibly rich economic actors. All of our students are buyers. All of them are sellers. They don't naturally think of themselves, by the way, as sellers. But of course, they're in the labor market. They're selling. They're consumers, for sure. They're investors. Uh, even if they're not holding stocks now, they're certainly investing in human capital right now. And so they're making decisions about whether to consume today versus tomorrow. They're managers, they're importers, and they're exporters. And so if that's actually the roles, very few of our students, I think, are going to play the role of, their, of economic policymaker. All of them are going to play these other very rich roles. And if that's the role they're going to play, then what's our job? And I think our job is not to think to help necessarily to focus so much on optimal policy, but instead to focus on how to help them make better decisions as buyers and sellers, as investors, as savers, as importers and exporters. And so, you know, that's why I say the first part of what useful economics is, is it starts by thinking about what the role is that our students will play as economic actors. And that then leads to this idea that what we want to do is focus on helping them make good decisions. I'm sort of unselfconsciously normative about that. I think there are good decisions you can make and bad decisions. And I think economics is a powerful framework for helping guide us towards making good decisions. And if we can help our students do that, we've more than earned our keep. So think about your training in economics. Think about how that informs how you live your life. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. I certainly feel, as a result, that I use the economic framework to make decisions about how to allocate my time, about how many children to have. There was a certain point where I decided the marginal benefit was no longer larger than the marginal cost, and I stopped after two children. I had to make a decision about how much to invest in my education. Um, and so that's where I think economics really can, and perhaps we should be quite unselfconscious about making, that making our focus, helping our students learn a framework which they can then employ to guide them towards good decisions. And the third thing, if we want that framework to be useful, it has to be broadly applicable. We can't learn a different framework for thinking about investing in our health versus investing in our education versus investing in, our, in the stock market. It would be useful if there's a few principles that one can apply throughout all of the decisions in our lives. Um, and they have to be applicable beyond the pecuniary domain. I think our students need no convincing that economics is about more than just the lemonade stand and uh, you know, the supply and demand of lemonade and what price is set. They're aware they're going to be making investments in their family and their health and their education. And they need to realize that what we're teaching them can be helpful for, for that. You know, this idea that there should be a principled approach to economics, I think it, it earns its, its clearest articulation from the late, great Gary Becker. The important point, it's easy in the sense there are only a few principles that really guide most economic analysis. His point, and I think it's right, is there are economic principles, and if you don't use them, you're likely to come to the wrong answers. The implication, then, I think for us is obvious. If we want our students to come to the right answers, um, we should be teaching them exactly those economic principles. 
so that's what I think useful economics is. It thinks about the role that our students play in the economy. Um, it then thinks about how they can make good decisions, and, and that's the focus, and that focus should be informed by a broadly applicable set of principles. And this, I think, very much describes it, how many of us think about economics anyway. Um, but it gives me a useful lens for trying to sort out what I think is useful for teaching versus what I can leave aside. So what I want to do is then make two more pitches to you. I want to talk about this. I, I think there's some sense in which this is a change from how we, certainly I was taught economics. And I think that uh, it's also a tremendous opportunity going forward. And I think it's an opportunity for two sets of reasons. And because I'm an economist, those two reasons are going to be supply and demand. But let's start on the supply side and with the empirical revolution. This just, you know, there's a million ways of making this point. This is a chart. The horizontal axis shows you time. On the, the vertical axis, we see how many microprocessors there are on each computer chip. So this is just Moore's law, right? So this is the fact that our computer processing power is, you know, doubling every couple of years. And there's got to be some opportunities that come out of that. But it's not just about processor power. The other thing that's happening is the amount of information that any of us are generating on any given day is enormous, right? You go to Starbucks and you use your Starbucks card. You then get on the metro, you use your metro card. Um, you then come out and you walk past some traffic lights which actually have cameras on them which may be counting how many people are walking past them. You walk into your office building which is actually counting how many people are going in and out. You go up the elevator which is actually counting how many people are on it. You log onto your computer, depending what university you're at, someone's, someone's keeping the logs there. You run a certain number of regressions and depending what software you have, you're, you, you may be told precisely how many regressions you ran that day. The point is that there's a time when understanding human behavior was very difficult because it was very difficult to get information about what it is that people do. Whereas in modern life, of course, almost everything is recorded somewhere. Um, so there's now, what, what that means in turn is that we're moving from a world that was incredibly data scarce, we knew very little about human behavior, to a world in which we have the opposite problem of excess abundance. And our students are gonna grow up in a world where they're going to talk naturally about terabytes of data and they're going to rely on what they learned in school to help guide them towards uh, extracting meaning from those data. Um, you can also just think about the rise of empirical economics. So again, we came from a world, when we were in a world with very little data, we had this thing called theory. And what theory was meant to do was fill in where, we're, where we didn't have good facts. If we didn't know what people were doing, we'd theorize about it instead. And so you see the share of, of journal articles that involve economic theory has gone down uh, quite substantially and instead what we're seeing is the real rise of empirical economics where people are, are going out and collecting the sorts of data that our students are going to be collecting naturally in their professional lives and so you see the profession itself changing and this looks like a trend that I can't that, that I can only imagine is going to continue to rise and that's why we as economics instructors also look very different than our economics professors it's very likely we learn from folks who are almost entirely pencil and paper theorists and um, very few of the profession are pencil and paper theorists anymore. So then that's what's happened on the supply side of the profession. What are the implications? So in the old days, data was scarce. We had to use theory then to fill in where we, we didn't have any data. And so when we talked about how people behaved, we had to rely on assumptions. That's why so often first day of economics would begin by the professor talking about how well, we're going to assume that people are rational and then learn from that how it is they behave. We're in a different world today, though. We, have, we, have, we know a lot about how people behave because we measure it. So today, we have a completely different problem, which is we have, I have, on my hard drive, certainly terabytes of data right now. Data are overabundant. And what I really need is a framework for helping me to extract meaning from those data. That framework's called economics, or economic theory. It's a, it, so it's the same economic theory that I learned decades ago. I hope not that, not that many decades ago. Um, but it's being put to a different purpose. And that suggests then maybe a different orientation in how we'd want to teach it. So theory then is a framework for organizing and understanding facts. And the other, thing, the other thing that's really neat about this is what we have to assume now. I remember very well my sister-in-law who'd just finished her first economics class. And I said, well, how did you find it? She said, it was stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, why? And she said, well, the professor started off by saying, I'm going to assume people are rational and figure out what we can get from that. And that seems like a really dumb idea. Um, of course people aren't rational. Now, we could have a long analytic discussion about whether people are rational. That's not the point. The point is that the professor lost her on the first date by making assumptions that she thought were manifestly unrealistic. We don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to make assumptions about how people behave. We measure it, and we can show it. 
I think the second thing that's changed for economics is that we have a much broader ambit. And whether you want to talk about this as being Gary Becker having extended the field into the economics of crime and the family, whether you want to think about Steve Levitt who suddenly made prostitutions and, and drug kingpings more interesting, or whether it's just the relentless march of our social science into becoming a more interesting social science as she started to understand the world around her. Certainly some of the most interesting issues I enjoyed studying are at the intersection of economics and sociology, in an, e economics and political science, economics and the law, economics and business. And I think that um, a lot of those are going to be a lot more compelling to many of our students. So um, I was trying to find how do you come up with evidence that economics has become sort of more creative? I, I don't have good evidence for you, but um, here's a, a, the results of a, a, a nice little piece of work by, by Steve Levitt and co-authors in which they looked to the leading empirical papers and they, asked, and they looked to see who were the theorists who inspired this work. And number one on this list is, of course, Gary Becker. Um, so Gary is, I think, the one who more than anyone has inspired us to think about economics as having a broader ambit. But there are others there as well. We've got the founders of the information economics revolution, Stiglitz, and Mil St Stiglitz Milgram, and Holmstrom, Benabu, who thinks a lot about culture and norms, Kahneman and Tversky, who tell us that um, economic behavior um, is largely shaped by psychological influences as well. Um, the great George Stigler, who told us a lot about political economy. The great George Akerlof, whose work over recent years has been about identity and group belonging, things that once we never thought had anything to do with economics. But I'd imagine when you teach, uh, when, you, when I first read those papers, they talked to me about my life. And that sense of belonging is a very important thing to our students. And if they can see that through the economic lens, that would be more helpful. And we've got folks like Hirsch Sheffer, a behavioral economist, even William Julius Wilson, who's a sociologist who's studied um, race in quite, quite some detail. So this is the sense in which I think economics is no longer just the simple economics of the lemonade stand of supply and demand and the pecuniary domain, but rather we've come to study a much broader and more interesting set of issues. Um, and I think the payoff from this, and I just want to make this argument briefly, is ultimately that we get a more realistic economics. My sister-in-law, who hated that first economics class, every time I get together with her, she asks me what I'm working on, and she's actually really interested in it. And she's like, why did the divorce rate rise in the United States? Um, or, you know, who do you think is likely to win the next election? Um, and I can actually talk to her about real economics. I just have to tell her it's, I just have to make sure not to tell her it's economics while we're doing it. <laughs> Um, and so she sees in the stuff that we all study um, a more realistic economics. She's not threatened by the sorts of work that we all do in a way that she was by that professor uh, in her intro class. 